All right. Uh, so for the last uh, lecture, I wanted to talk about uh, one more application to theoretical computer science of ideas from information theory. I mean, this is kind of actually uh, an application of ideas from theoretical computer science to information theory and uh, sort of uh, also the other way around, as you will see, it sort of uh, combines the ideas from both uh, areas. And the basic result is uh, kind of relatively simple to state. So for example, for the binary symmetric channel, we saw there's kind of an explicit capacity achieving uh, construction of codes, which is uh, uh, polar codes. Um, and uh, so it's uh, still been an open question for quite some time about various classical code families like Reed Solomon and Reed Miller, how they behave. Uh, and in particular, uh, how good uh, can Reed Miller codes be for random noise? And uh, previous results were known in kind of some sort of very extreme or special cases when uh, the uh, kind of uh, rate of the code was sort of very, very close to zero or very, very close to one. So the noise was extremely small. Or, uh, but uh, this paper from 2016 sort of uh, basically resolved this question for all uh, rates and uh, all kinds of error probabilities for the binary erasure channel. And moreover, it introduced a new technique uh, for uh, proving that sort of certain code families can achieve capacity or are good for certain kinds of errors using sort of just some relatively weak information about the code, in particular, some sort of symmetry properties of the code. And we'll see what kind of properties we need here. Okay. Uh, we'll be discussing the binary erasure channel, just to remind you. It's a channel which kind of with probability one minus P transmits zero or one of, uh, correctly. And with probability P transmits uh, an error symbol using star, we use this kind of bot symbol earlier, basically something which says uh, that, okay, this bit got deleted, uh, oops. So, uh, and the goal is of course, to try and recover the code word that was sent or the message that was sent. Um, uh, I mean, even given these kind of erasures and how do we design codes like this? Just a recap, uh, we computed the capacity of the binary erasure channel. Anyone remember how much that was? Um, if with probability P we have erasures or the bits get uh, lost. And type it in the chat if you want. But Okay, while maybe someone is looking up the capacity, but uh, let me also say that we can think of this in another way. So uh, for every transmission, we generate a random ZI, which is completely independent of X, uh, which is one with uh, probability P and zero with probability one minus P. And if the ZI comes up one, Basically, that means we delete uh, the bit or there is an erasure. We don't send X and YI is just star. And if ZI comes up zero, then we send uh, YI equals XI. So just like uh, in the binary symmetric channel, we thought of sort of uh, using ZI to, uh, or like XORing ZI with the bits of X. And so ZI can be thought of as independent of X then. It's just the combination gives us Y. Similarly here, we can think of ZIs as uh, independent of X, instead of XR, we are going to use it to mask some of the bits of X and just kind of uh, erase them and replace them by star. Uh, the capacity of the channel is one minus two. And so what we will show is that um, uh, you can get Reed Miller codes with um, uh, rates as large as one minus P, uh, which um, uh, will thus be capacity achieving for this uh, particular channel. Okay. A recap on Reed Miller codes. Uh, so, I mean, we won't be using the kind of the exact nature of the code, just a couple of properties of it. But uh, let me 
now also kind of introduce the full code as i mentioned when we were talking about read miller codes earlier that what we are discussing is a sub code then the full code is actually just defined like read solomon so uh, it's the evaluation of uh, a polynomial on various input points uh, we will take the uh, evaluation points uh, to be everything. So let's say the polynomial is in M variables uh, over F2. So we will evaluate it for all possible settings of these M variables. And instead of sort of looking at this description that we saw earlier for local decoding, where this polynomial comes from some set H, we're just going to look at all polynomials. So <clears throat> Any polynomial m variables where the total degree of any monomial is at most d, we are going to consider its evaluation. And the set of all such evaluations forms uh, the code, okay. just like Reed Solomon. And there you know, we were looking at a polynomial in one variable, now we have m variables, nothing else really changed. And okay. Now, just a bit of uh, sanity check what is the block length of this code? How long is every code word? Block length is just the length of a single code word. Anyone? Someone? Two to the m. Two to the m. Uh, so each code word is kind of one polynomial written down at all evaluation points. There are two to the m evaluation points. Uh, what is the dimension or Another way of asking is how many polynomials um, or uh, yeah, what is the dimension of the space of polynomials of total degree D? Well, we can consider uh, the coefficient of the unique monomial of degree zero, which is just uh, the kind of monomial one. Uh, then there are uh, M monomials of degree one, which uh, correspond to either x1 or x2 and so on. Uh, so the number of uh, monomials we can have, and each can have a coefficient which is zero or one. So the dimension of the code or the you know, dimension of the message space, if you want, is uh, just kind of the number of coefficients you can choose. And uh, the rate, of the code is, yeah, I mean, as I said in the notes, there are kind of two ways the rate is defined sometimes, whether you take a log of the message space uh, base Q or base two, here Q is two, so it doesn't really matter. Both of them are the same. And the rate of the code is just the dimension of uh, the code space K divided by uh, block length N. And uh, now if we want the rate to be constant, uh, we want the rate to be uh, something which is comparable to the capacity, one minus p. If you think of p as a constant, say half, we want rate to be constant. And for this, we want to uh, choose d to be roughly uh, between m over 2 minus some constant times uh, square root m to m over two plus some constant times square root m because uh, this binomial distribution uh, kind of looks like a Gaussian and uh, actually a thinner Gaussian. So and most of the action is in an interval of root m around m over 2 or most of the probability mass is there so we want the number of monomials to be at, uh, at least half of uh, uh, 2 to the m and so we want the degree to be large enough that um, uh, i mean yeah if we take it beyond that then the sort of uh, the rate will basically become one or sort of very very close to one which is okay, but uh, uh, so if, if the capacity of the channel is smaller than one, then this kind of code might not be so useful. 
So for any kind of constant rate, we will have to think of D within somewhere around M over two. Uh, just, and yeah, we don't really need this. So we just kind of are going to remember that there is some setting of the degree D so that the rate is constant. We don't really know, need to know exactly what it is. And the distance, uh, if you remember the polynomial identity lemma, you can check that it was um, about n over two to the d uh, for this setup, which will be uh, two to the m over uh, two to the d. D is about two to the uh, d is about m over two. So this will be roughly, or we should roughly think of it as square root m. That is to say that the distance is actually much, much smaller than the number of bits that get corrupted. The number of bits that are getting corrupted is um, in expectation uh, p times n, or the number of bits which have erasures is about p times n. And uh, if you think of p as a constant, again, you can think of p as one third or half if you like, uh, then about one third or half of the bits uh, are erased the distance of the code is much smaller than that, but it's still be able to achieve capacity and it will still be able to uh, correct these erasures uh, because of the structure and certain symmetries of the code. And we'll talk about that. Any questions before we proceed? Can I ask a question? I thought like last time you you, you mentioned read Miller code, I thought the dimension is a bit different, right? Like Yeah, um... so that's why, so last time what I mentioned, I kind of said that this is a sub code of read Miller code or I'm using a slightly different definition where the dimension basically corresponded to some k to the m where k was some small set that I took inside it. Um, uh, and uh, I said that we can look at the full Reed Miller code, but the dimension computation is a little more complicated and we can't do local decoding if we refine it that way. So this is the full Reed Miller code. The dimension computation is a bit more involved in terms of this summation. So okay, instead of it. saying that a message is kind of values on h, uh, sort of h to the m, I'm just saying a message is any list of coefficients and that gives me a polynomial. I just evaluate the polynomial at all points. Okay, okay got it. Right. Any other questions? All right, so you don't exactly need to remember all these parameters. This is just sort of uh, to say what the code is. All we will need to remember is it's kind of evaluation of all polynomials of degree at most D at all, all two to the M points. And because of this nature of it, it um, and there are certain choices for D such that the rate can be tuned to become whatever constant you want. Uh, because of this kind of definition, it will uh, have certain symmetry properties and we'll just actually very quickly just transition to those symmetry properties and not bother about exactly what the code was. Okay. So, uh, and the technique in this paper is general enough. It sort of shows that as long as you have a code with uh, these kind of symmetry properties, it, it achieves um, capacity or it, it behaves very nicely for binary erasure channel. Uh, and we'll see how to take advantage of these symmetries. Uh, the kind of two properties we will use for Reed Miller code is that they are linear, which we have already discussed. And um, uh, so if, uh, just like Reed Solomon, and we also discussed um, sort of other versions of Reed uh, Miller, and just because kind of co coefficients to evaluations is a linear map. Okay. And the interesting and new property which we will discuss, uh, which we will use, is the fact that they are what um, is called doubly transitive. So, uh, and We'll prove this, but before going there, let's just define what uh, we'll call transitive. So, uh, so forget about read Miller codes for a second. Just think of a collection of uh, n-bit strings, and we will call this collection transitive if, uh, for every string, I just swap, let's say, any two bits of my choice. So, I, for every string, I uh, swap the third and the 53rd bit. And the set of strings is the same. It doesn't change. Every string can change. It can happen that the third and 53rd bit in a given string are different. So one is zero, the other is one. All I'm saying is that the overall set of strings doesn't change. So uh, for every swap, uh, there is some other string which is exactly like that. Right. Is the definition okay? Mm. 
uh, here i is equal to j is kind of trivial so let's assume that i is not equal to j uh, so uh, and i'm not even saying that uh, if i just swap these two bits actually yeah what i want to say is that there is some permutation which in particular swaps these two bits but might do other stuff uh, but there is a way of kind of uh, writing these code words such that in the new list uh, the third and 53rd bits get swapped okay might be other bits get changed also that's fine so but uh, i can move the third bit to the 53rd position without uh, changing the set of code words any questions about the definition? And what do bits correspond to in Reed Miller codes? These are evaluation points. There is one bit for every two, no, every each one of the two to the m evaluation points. So, what I'm going, uh, uh, what I'm looking for is how do I uh, kind of change the code word or go from one code word to another code word such that let's say mm. the bit corresponding to u1 and u2 get swapped. So uh, uh, u1 gets mapped to u2 and u2 gets mapped to u1, let's see. Doesn't have to be the first two positions, u1 and u2 can be arbitrary points. And, uh, and assume that, uh, okay, for now let's say, uh, they are both non-zero. Any suggestions on? Uh, so what I want to say is that there is another code word in which these two positions are split. So there is some other polynomial. Okay. Such that what is written in the first position, uh, f prime u1 is actually equal to f of u2. And what is written in the second position, f prime of u2 is equal to f of u1. I'm not making any claims about what happens in other positions, but I'm just saying that there is a polynomial, which is also a low degree polynomial in M variables, such that uh, the value of this polynomial at u1 is equal to the value of the original polynomial at u2 and vice versa. Any guesses or any suggestions for how to do it? Just take a linear map that maps uh, like f2 to the m to f2 to the m such that uh, this u1 and u2 are swapped and then f uh, this f hat is or f prime is just f composed with this linear map. Good. So uh, u1 and u2 are not zero so they are linearly independent uh, in uh, f2 to the m. Uh, so I can find a linear map or a matrix m such that it maps uh, u1 to u2 and u2 to u1. And I can complete this matrix to a sort of a full rank matrix over the entire space in whatever way I want. So uh, but if I want to design a linear map, I can sort of make it do whatever I want on a basis. And I can because u1 and u2 are linearly independent, I can find a basis containing these two. And now I will just take f prime of uh, u to be f of m times u. So f prime of u1 will be equal to f of u2 and the other way around. Uh, you can check what happened, sort of uh, what to do when uh, it's zero. Yeah, the hint is that you can take an affine map. So, but we don't uh, need to worry about it uh, for now. And now it's called doubly transitive. If I can kind of uh, find a permutation which swaps, let's say, two positions J1, J2, while keeping a third position I fixed. So now uh, I want to still swap two positions, but also there is a special one which I don't want to change at all in pi. And the proof is almost the same uh, as before. So what I want is, uh, uh, let's say, 
I want to keep U1 fixed. Uh, I want to swap U2 with um, U3. And I want to swap um, U3 with U2. And the way to do this is more or less the same as before. Um, let's again assume that all three of them are different. Um, and I can find a linear map M, which uh, uh, maps u3 minus u1 to u2 minus u1 and maps u2 minus u1 to u3 minus u1. And I'll define kind of a more general linear map L or a fine linear map L, uh, which will be L of u will be m times u plus u1. So it will be an affine map. And now we can check what happens. So uh, L of U1 will be M times, uh, oh, sorry, I should have said what I mean by M times. Uh, no, sorry. M times U minus U1 plus U1. So uh, L of U1 is U1, L of U2 is uh, uh, M times U2 minus U1 plus U1, which is equal to U3 minus U1 plus U1, which is U3, and similarly for U2. And I take my F prime to be, uh, so F prime of U uh, to be, f of l of u and yeah I should have maybe also said in the previous one that if you look at a low degree polynomial but uh, apply some sort of linear transformation on its variables it still uh, remains a low degree polynomial for every monomial you just now have uh, some linear combination of the old variables but the degree doesn't change so in general, these are called affine invariant codes, uh, which, which don't change because of any kind of affine transformations. And uh, here we get double uh, sort of the, these kind of codes are also doubly transitive. Any questions uh, before we proceed? Okay, just to say, I mean, yeah, we won't necessarily need this kind of exact uh, proof uh, for the rest of the. Uh, lecture, but it's kind of uh, good to know why they're doubly transitive, but we'll just need this sort of position that um, basically J2 and J3 or J1 and J2 are equivalent uh, kind of given I, so we can fix I and uh, the positions J2 and uh, J1 as we go over the entire code are sort of interchangeable. Okay. Right. Now, what we will prove is that uh, when the rate of the code is less than one minus p, we can recover almost all bits. Strictly speaking, we need to recover all bits and uh, I'll say what needs to change in the proof to do that, but uh, I'll prove that we might, we'll be able to recover one minus little o of one fraction of all bits um, or the fraction of bits which we will not be able to recover will go to zero. Uh, And the sort of proof will be a little bit of a perspective shift. So instead of sort of think, uh, fixing P, which is defining our binary erasure channel, and then seeing uh, how much can I increase the rate so that things work out, or sort of how much um, the rate, uh, how large can I take the rate to be, we will flip the picture and we'll kind of fix a code with a given rate, and then see what happens as I change P. Can I recover uh, the bits of the code or not? So for what P, what values of P is this? Uh, rate R code still a good code or uh, can it recover uh, almost all bits? Okay. And to do this, we'll kind of define a function uh, in a bit, um, which we'll call E of P. And this is generally, um, yeah, coding theory this is something called the exit map function, uh, which will capture basically what is the fraction of bits which we cannot recover. Okay. Divided by one over P, because to think about it, 
in the worst case, p fraction of the bits will be corrupted. So the worst possible fraction of bits which we cannot recover is p. And so dividing by one over p just kind of normalizes it to be between zero and one. It's a nicer object to look at. But this is nothing other than a normalization. Excuse me. And uh, now we'll kind of study this function e of p uh, as p changes and r is fixed. And what we would like to show is that uh, if e of p uh, goes to zero for all p less than one minus r. Right? So as I said, we are kind of actually thinking of changing p, fixing r. So for all p which is uh, less than one minus r, we would like to show that uh, this is the kind of channels for which we hope uh, rate r codes would be good. And we want to say that um, uh, if you look at a Reed Miller code with rate r, um, e of p will go to zero uh, for all p, which is uh, uh, below one minus r. Any questions about the goal or what we would like to show? So, so the thing that you wrote is like a typo, right? It's like divided by one by p, so it into p, or is it? Sorry? So, so in the definition, uh -huh. is it into one by p or divided by one by p? No, it's times one by p or divided by p. Uh, so, the worst possible fraction of bits which we cannot recover otherwise will be p, because p bits will be corrupted. P fraction of the bits will be corrupted, right? Um, or like p fraction of bits will have erasures in uh, uh, a channel otherwise. And I want to normalize it to be between uh, zero and one. So I want this function e of p to take values between zero and one rather than between zero and p. So the maximum value otherwise would have been p. Now I'm actually changing it so that the maximum value becomes one. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. I mean, it's just saying out of the sort of, it's just uh, dividing uh, the fraction of bits which we cannot recover uh, divided by the fraction of bits which actually get corrupted. Right? And the fraction of bits which actually gets corrupted is P. Out of them, how many can, can we not recover? Make sense? It's, uh... Yeah. Okay. So is this EP the expected number or? This will or... be the expected number, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll define it precisely in a minute, but this will be the expected fraction of bits that we cannot recover. Uh, the expectation will be uh, both over choosing a random code word and uh, choosing a random uh, uh, sequence of erasures. Okay. Uh, and this proof kind of combines two nice arguments, uh, one half from information theory and uh, the other half from analysis of Boolean functions. So, and I'll kind of go over the proof of the first part in more detail as sort of sketch the part about Boolean analysis. So, but there is an information theoretic argument which says that what we want to show is that E of P is kind of is zero for uh, P which is below one minus R. And the information theoretic argument says that I don't quite know what the curve looks like or what the sort of curve of this function E of P looks like as P changes. But I know the area under the curve and the area under the curve is uh, exactly equal to the rate of the code or uh, K over N or R, whichever you. There is a separate set of techniques from Boolean analysis, which says that uh, I don't know what sort of, uh, uh, sorry, I know that the shape of this function will be like a step function. Okay, so it will kind of be zero for some time and will jump to one for some time though I don't know where this uh, step will happen or sort of where this uh, jump will happen. Okay, it could happen very close to one, very close to zero for all I care. I don't quite know how to place it. And this is actually often a problem, like a lot of problems where we can prove that this sort of step happens where we'd like to argue about it, but in, not in all of them can we actually locate uh, where this step happens. But you put the two of them together and then you can actually argue very nicely about what happens because you look at this curve, the area, if you know that it's going to be this sort of step function, which 
changes from zero to the maximum value of one uh, at some point, I don't know what this point is, let's call it the threshold T. Then I know that the area of the curve um, is actually equal to zero times for length t, it's just zero. And for the length one minus t, it's one. And this is also equal to uh, the rate. And this gives me that t is equal to one minus r. So precisely at uh, the probability of p equals one minus r, this curve will jump up. In particular, for all p less than one minus r, uh, the fraction of bits which we cannot recover will tend to zero. So we will be able to recover almost all bits. So uh, this is the precisely the region and this threshold will be one minus r. Okay. And I, I should emphasize that, yeah, I mean, in Boolean analysis, you can often prove these kind of threshold behaviors, but locating this threshold is quite difficult. And the information theoretic argument, because it gives us the area under the curve, it actually gives us a nice way of locating this threshold. And yeah, it's a simple combination of these two arguments. Although, yeah, each of them is, is not to involve the fact that the combination can be done in general for any kind of doubly transitive code is very nice. Any questions before we proceed? Yeah, so this paper came out of a Simons program uh, on information theory, combinatorics, computer science, uh, I guess 2015 or something where it did actually have people from both you know, information theory com communities and uh, uh, the theoretical computer science community. And uh, once they talked to each other, they realized that they had kind of different halves of the problem. Uh, and then sort of uh, this, this combination came out. Uh, and we'll sketch uh, the second half and maybe go over the first half in more detail. Any questions about what we are going to prove before we proceed? Uh, just, uh, I mean, I'll define this E of P more precisely in a bit, uh, but the structure of the argument is that there is some way to kind of locate the area under the curve and there is some way to prove the shape of the curve is a, a step function. And these two facts together give you exactly the result that you want uh, that uh, the uh, fraction of bits which we cannot recover is tending to zero precisely till p equals one minus r, which is exactly what we want for capacity. Okay. All right, so uh, let's start analyzing this. Uh, uh, yeah, the proof is actually not too complicated, at least the information theory side of it. And the Boolean analysis is not complicated, but uses a couple of of lemmas from earlier work. Uh, the sort of uh, key part is just sort of uh, rewriting what is the probability that a bit cannot be recovered um, and uh, uh, that uh, we cannot sort of given uh, what we received, given the y, we cannot uh, find the ith bit of x. And my claim is that. Uh, this sort of uh, is, has kind of a uh, uh, sort of only two kinds of behavior. Either we know exactly what the bit is, or we have no idea what the bit is. And in the entropy of uh, Xi is just one given uh, Y. And it's always going to be one of these two. So, uh, um, I should say this is conditioned on a specific way. So given some uh, sequence of uh, zero, one and stars uh, in particular, we can look at the positions where the stars are and uh, uh, say, what is the chance? Uh, uh, okay. So first of all, uh, if yi, Uh, is not equal to star, then of course, there is nothing to argue about. So uh, H of Xi given Y 
equals little y is zero, right? Because if this bit was not erased, we know it. Uh, there is nothing to do. Uh, so the only interesting case is when this bit was erased, and let's see what happens there. And now, uh, and the initial code word I'm assuming is kind of coming randomly from the entire uh, code space. Uh, so random code word from. And now I claim that, uh, let's prove uh, the if part of the statement. So let's say there exists a W with this kind of properties that the if bit of W is equal to one. Uh, and uh, W is, covered by stars, which I should explain what it means. So covered by is sort of all the one bits of W. So if WJ is one, then we must have a star there. So there can be many more stars, but uh, no one bit of uh, W is left out in particular the ith bit of w also has a star on it. So yi is equal to star, but also any other j where wj is one, then we have a star. And now I claim we have no idea what the entropy of xi is because uh, the probability of any code word x given what we know is equal to the probability of x plus w given what we know. Why is that? Because the bits of w or the ones of w are completely covered by y. The positions which are covered by y are equally likely to be zero or one, or we don't know which one. And so in those positions, it's just as likely that uh, I, I change X by the bits of W versus I don't. It only changes things which are hidden by stars. Okay. So, and in particular, uh, this says that uh, the ith bit is one given Y is equal to Y or the ith bit is zero given Y is equal to Y is, uh, is half because wi is one. So one of these either x or x plus w has the ith bit as one, the other has zero. And so uh, we get a bijection between uh, uh, possible code words with the ith bit one versus possible code words with the ith bit zero. Okay, any questions about this part? So if, the entropy, if there is such a code word, then the entropy is one. We have no information about what the ith bit is. And conversely, if the entropy is not uh, sort of, if the entropy is not zero, so if, then uh, there exists two code words, um, uh, Uh, w1, or let's say w and w prime, uh, such that the ith bit is different. And uh, both have pos positive probability. Given y. So, Otherwise, if there was only one code word which had positive probability, or at least all code words which had positive probability given y, if they all agreed in the ith bit, then we would know the ith bit and the entropy would be zero. So the reason it's non-zero is that there is some uncertainty. And so there is at least two code words uh, which have this property. But if that's true, uh, these are both code words, by the way, because we know we sent a code word. Uh, 
and so we are only going to decode to code words. But then W plus W prime is a code word. And uh, the ith bit of W plus W prime has to be one because W and W prime differ there. And moreover, uh, since we cannot tell between W and W prime, the difference of them, uh, these two must be hidden. So, if not, we would be able to at least uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, say which is the case with whether we have W or W prime. So, the positions in which they differ, we have we don't quite know. Otherwise, we would be able to at least find one position in which they differ and observe it, and know that we don't have W or we don't have W prime. So this sort of is an if and only if, and we get that the entropy of xi given y is either one or zero. Uh, and so this kind of has a nicer consequence in terms of how we write the probability that we cannot recover a certain bit. So the probability that we cannot recover the ith bit is just the expectation over y, h of xi given y equals y. Uh, or h of xi given capital Y. So there is a clean way of writing what is the probability that the ith bit cannot be recovered. It's just the entropy of xi given y okay, as a random variable. Any questions about this? So this is the kind of starting of the information theoretic uh, uh, argument. The first thing we do is rephrase the question or the quantity we are talking about, which is this probability in terms of entropies, and then we go from there. Okay, and I'll define, instead of saying uh, this E of P, I'll just define E sub i of p, which is just measuring the probability that the ith bit cannot be decoded. Uh, and I claim that it can also be written as uh, uh, xi given all bits of y except the ith one. So this is just the notation. For giving all bits of y except uh, yi. And yeah, this is just uh, computation from previous expressions. So uh, we know that the probability that bit i cannot be decoded uh, is equal to h of xi given all of uh, y. And now there are two things that can happen. Uh, the ith bit can either be star, uh, which happens with probability p, or it can not be star, which happens with probability one minus p. If it's not star, then the entropy is zero. And so the only thing we are left with it, uh, is that this is equal to p times the conditioning and if it's star it doesn't really tell us about anything about the ith bit so if we know that it's star it's just like removing the conditioning on the ith bit um, because all the other bits of y are independent or are independently changed to 0 1 or star so we can also write it this way 
And yeah, so that gives us the expression we want. Uh, we will, the, the function E of P that we will define um, will just be the average of the EIs. So this will just be the fraction of bits uh, which cannot be decoded. Uh, and we'll study uh, this function. Okay. Any questions before we proceed? I'll sort of say a little more about slightly different function in a bit. Okay. Uh, for the purposes of analysis, it will be useful to consider slightly more uh, generalized functions where uh, as just as a thought experiment, we are going to think of changing every uh, bit position i with uh, sort of, uh, or masking it with, or erasing it with probability pi instead of p and potentially a different number for each coordinate. Actually, we will never use different numbers for different coordinates. This is just a formal expression so that we will be able to take the derivative with respect to the probability of the first coordinate or second coordinate and so on, which will kind of facilitate the integral which we want to compute. Other than that, it will not really change anything. So uh, what we call EI of P is just uh, now EI when all probabilities are the same. So uh, we just have P, P1, Pn all are equal to P. So, but in sort of in principle, we can look at a vector uh, of these and uh, we'll just define EI of a vector of probabilities P bar as exactly the same expression as before, except this Y now uh, is uh, distributed according to P bar. So uh, every in every position, in the ith position, X is copied with probability one minus PI and erased with probability PI. And potentially this can be different. Any questions uh, before we proceed? This is just for the analysis. Uh, we're not actually analyzing a more complicated channel. We'll just use this to define one derivative, which is this. And this kind of makes more sense when you have uh, different numbers. Uh, mm. And here this y is defined according to p bar. And so we can take its derivative with respect to any one of these probabilities. Uh, and yeah, you see, it's just a kind of slight trick to simplify the computation. So we can write uh, uh, h of x given uh, y p bar as um, uh, H of xi given y plus the rest. Uh, mm. And as before, this we can write as pi times uh, h of xi given. So there are two possibilities for the ith coordinate. Either y is equal to star, which happens with probability pi, or it's not, in which case the entropy is zero. Plus, uh, whatever is here doesn't really uh, change things. So, mm. so, mm. the part here, because we are talking of other positions, uh, uh, Mm. 
this only depends on uh, so it depends on all the probabilities except pi so that just means when we actually look at the derivative um, we just get this term if they were all p's the things would get a little complicated and you would have to understand the second term so this is just like a convenient trick to uh, isolate the term that we want so this is just uh, the derivative with respect to pi is just h of xi given just as a yeah more as a formal expression but this gives us the way of evaluating the integral we want so we wanted to understand the area under the curve for this e of p and we want to prove that it's actually equal to the rate r uh, and we can just think of uh, this integral as uh, integrating over this kind of vector valued variable p bar but when the vector is actually just going across on the curve where all coordinates are equal so uh, we are just moving along the curve or the, along the line where all coordinates are equal to p and p is going from 0 to 1 okay. and but if we write it this way uh, um, we can write it as um, we can take the one over and outside summation over i e i of p bar uh, the e i of p bar is just um, I'm just using the fact that this is just one, so I can introduce this term. Pi of p is just t. It is just going from zero to one. And so I can just write this as, I'm just integrating along this curve, so I can write this as integral, sort of just evaluated the limits. And um, at the limit, I'm looking at h of um, x, uh, given y uh, which is according to the all ones uh, erasure probabilities minus h of x y which is according to all zero probabilities and these two quantities I know how to evaluate so if the erasure probability was one for every position so everything got erased then what is the entropy of x given y I send a random code word, but it is everything. Uh, what do you know about the code word given what you receive? Is it zero, right? Well, the entropy is not zero. The information we have is zero if we erase everything. So, uh, the, so one is the erasure probability. Okay. Uh, I guess what you are answering is for this part where we transmit everything faithfully, then the entropy is zero. But in the first term, in the binary symmetric channel or binary erasure channel with probability p, we erase with probability p and send with probability 1 minus p. So when p is 1, we erase everything. And so the entropy of what was sent, given what was received, is everything because you have no information and it's just... Uh, 
based on what you received, you can't tell anything about it. So this is just um, h of x, uh, which is uh, k because the dimension of the code was k. So the, the number of code words was two to the k. Uh, and here we erased with probability uh, zero. So we actually sent everything. And so if you receive the string sort of uh, completely accurately, then given what you received, the sort of entropy of, of what was sent is zero. You exactly know what was received. So conditioned on what you received, there is no entropy left. So this is zero. And so we get the integral, which is k over x. Okay, so that's the information theory part, uh, kind of more or less, and then we'll sort of go over the Boolean analysis part of it. Any questions about this? Uh, one additional observation, which will be useful in analyzing it, is that all the EIs are actually equal. So, Okay, so this is something to check as an exercise. Um, but basically the code is such that uh, the bit in the ith position can be like uh, bits in ith position can be moved to any jth position if you want. Um, and the set of code words remains the same. So if I sent uh, a random code word, the statistics of the ith position are the same as the statistics of the jth position. and uh, in relation to that, uh, uh, and then the erasures are kind of uh, the same for all positions. So you can use this to prove that uh, the probability that the ith bit cannot be recovered is just some condition that there exists a code word, uh, like what's the probability that the erasures is such that there exists a code word, one in the ith position, et cetera. But you can show that that probability is exactly the same as there exists a code word, which is one in the jth position, uh, and it's covered by erasures because the ith position and jth position are the same as long as you go over the entire code. All right. So, so for the rest of it, so the nice thing is, e i uh, is a slightly easier function to write down if you kind of fix an i, uh, but we don't really lose anything uh, because of this property. It's just um, uh, the probabilities are the same for all different coordinates. Okay, and now let's write down this EI more explicitly. Uh, so, as I said, uh, uh, this is just the probability, or as we saw, uh, if a bit cannot be recovered if there exists a code word, one in the ith position, which is uh, the entire code word is covered by uh, stars. So, Let's just write down what happens in the other positions. Okay. And let's just, uh, instead of thinking of stars, let's just think of zeros and ones. And when there is a one uh, that's just the same as saying we can get a star in that position. Okay. But now we want to think of functions over zero one. So it's just slightly cleaner to write, to think in terms of these Zs. Uh, and we are saying, uh, what is the patterns of stars you can have which cover some code word? Uh, or what is the probability that the pattern of stars is such that they cover at least some code word which is one in the ith position? Okay. So let's just define the set omega i, which is just the set of all star patterns or all the set of all one patterns for z that will kind of render the ith bit so sort of, uh, unrecoverable. Uh, so we won't be able to, uh, so these are just whatever patterns of star uh, cover up some code word um, 
And in terms of zero ones, I can use this notation of less than equal to, which just means that um, bitwise, um, if I look at bits of uh, uh, w, then it has to be less than or equal to the corresponding bit of uh, zj. So this is just another way of saying that if wj has a one, then uh, zj must be one. So it must cover the code word. And the probability that the bit i cannot be covered is just, um, uh, of course, I should get a star in the ith position. That's sort of essential. So I'll just write that separately. And the rest of the positions uh, must correspond to some z in this set omega i. So I can write this as a probability that I sample z, which is this pattern of stars or pattern of ones now, um, according to the Bernoulli distribution, so that every position is hidden with probability p. And the z is in this set omega i. And we call this probability that i bit cannot be recovered divided by a little p was precisely this ei of p. So this is exactly an expression for ei of p. But now written in terms of this omega i. Any questions uh, with this? Set? We're just kind of writing out what are all the bad events that can happen, which will cause the ith bit unrecoverable. We had a characterization of all these bad events that uh, your stars cover some code word with one in the ith position. So we just form the set of all uh, possible bad positions in which you can put stars, uh, which will render this bit unrecoverable and just call that set omega i. But then in this form, it's kind of nice. It's just the expectation of um, some Boolean function, uh, which is sort of a zero one valued function. On n minus one bits. It's just the indicator function for the set omega i. It's just ch checking if this given string of n minus one bits lies inside this set omega i or not. But it's a function which takes values only zero and one. And once we have that, we can actually apply a lot of tools from analysis of Boolean functions. In particular, this function has two nice properties, um, which basically finish the proof. Um, uh, the first is that it's, uh, well, okay, it actually has three nice properties, but we'll, we'll get to that. So uh, the first property is, um, the function is monotone. So if I look at some pattern of stars, which has more stars than Z or sort of the Z prime has more ones than Z. So it's actually hiding more bits. Then it's also bad. So if Z was bad, then so is Z prime. Uh, that's just because kind of more erasures uh, cannot help you. So they will still obstruct, they will still cover the code word if uh, Z was covering the code. And uh, the second property is that it's symmetric in some sense again. So, uh, and this sort of requires a little bit of proof, which I will not go into, but I just want to sort of mention what this property is called. So this is just saying that, uh, uh, so how critical is the jth bit? Uh, uh, if I change this jth bit, so I just change it from zero to one or one to zero, uh, then do I go in and out of the set omega i or like is the star on the jth location really crucial to kind of causing a problem or not? Yeah. And this is also known as um, the influence of this function um, denoted as the influence of the jth bit on this function. And this function is omega i. And we also kind of put this p on top to just say that we are talking about the distribution where the 
z is just coming from this Bernoulli distribution. And the influences of all bits are equal and this uses double transitivity. So it just says if you fix the ith bit, uh, even then any j1 and j, sort of j2 bits uh, behave the same uh, in this function. And again, it requires a little bit of a proof, but not much harder than the proof about transitivity using uh, like uh, proof about uh, about E i is equal to E using transitivity. The third property is uh, E i of zero is equal to zero and E i of one is equal to. Uh, and that just follows from uh, the definition. So if P is equal to zero, then the only string we will ever get is just the all zero string. All zero string cannot be a bad string. It's not covering anything. Uh, let's assume that there is no code word with one only in the ith position. It has at least two ones. In fact, the distance of our code was root m. So it has to have more ones and uh, it can't happen that the all zero string uh, covers anything. And the all one string is covering everything. It's just sort of putting stars everywhere. So it's definitely bad. So uh, if I have P equals one, then the only string I will get is the all one string. And that is certainly bad. The expectation will be just one because that's the only element I will actually get. So I need, I know these two properties. And then, uh, I mean, yeah, these are things I will not sort of go into too much detail about, but uh, there are sort of a nice ways of understanding what the derivative of such a function looks like. So there is what's called the Russo Margolis lemma, which says if you have a monotone function uh, of n bits, I'm just writing n minus one to kind of type match with the previous page, um, then the derivative of this of how it changes as p changes is just the sum of the influences of all the coordinates. So just kind of uh, the probability of the jth coordinate, j1th coordinate is critical or j2th coordinate is critical and so on. And then there is a, a classic theorem of Kahn Kalai in lineal, which says that for any function g, uh, there is at least one coordinate with whose influence is at least log n over n or log of n minus one over n minus one, times the expectation of the function. Um, uh, so and because of symmetry, uh, all influences are equal. So here we get uh, uh, which is log of n minus one times the expectation of G one minus expectation of G. The G is this, this one of omega. So that's just E i of P. And so we get that the derivative of this E i of P function or the E of P, they are all equal, but let's just fix with E i here. Uh, is, is at least log n. In particular, it's kind of super constant. Um, and that just means that the, so this function is zero at zero, one at one. So it has to increase at some point. But we also know that the moment it goes above epsilon, the derivative, or like even a little bit, the derivative becomes log n, which is really, really high. So in a space of about one over log n, in fact, even faster, it actually shoots up all the way to one. Because the moment it becomes even slightly large, the derivative becomes super large. And then the derivative kind of only stops being large when it becomes really close to one. And this is called the threshold behavior of these sort of functions. This happens in general for monotone symmetric functions. So this is just a particular example. Okay. Uh, yeah, these things, I won't go into details of these proofs. So this proves that, I mean, 
any so like most bits can be recovered uh, if you want to prove that any bits are uh, like no bit is left unrecovered then you have to use a slightly stronger property of not just that the derivative is positive but how fast this function grows and um, uh, this needs additional symmetries plus a theorem of Burgin and Kalai which says that the derivative is actually strictly larger than log n or asymptotically bigger than log n. Uh, there is a nice survey by uh, Abesh Pilka and Yi on lots of recent developments around Reed Miller codes. In fact, uh, in particular, a lot of open questions also. And there is a nice survey by Kalai. Uh, and of course, there is a nice uh, book by O'Donnell uh, on analysis of Boolean functions um, uh, in case you want to read more about these properties. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention this because it's a very nice uh, combination of information theory and uh, Boolean analysis, which was a bit unusual and it introduces a new technique in information theory. Okay, that's pretty much it for now. And I guess for the course, uh, any questions or comments?